The turning point was 2003 and I would say now in hindsight that was probably the best thing that ever happened to the club. Born in Exeter, lived in a stone's throw from the ground over the back of an Tivent Road, then Longbrook Street until I was 11 and uh, I've lived in Exmouth ever since. I used to come up with my dad. Uh, my dad uh, was actually here when I was born because at that stage uh, dads weren't allowed to attend the birth. So okay. I think he got fed up waiting down at Mowbray Maternity Hospital and he came up here and uh, was watching the reserves when I was born at 20 past eight in the evening. Um, we lived in a flat over the back. Morris Setters and Theo Foley were at the club at the time, they're starting their careers. They lodged in the same house. So yeah. I think one of the first contacts I would have had as a, a very young baby would have been with, with uh, City players. Um, and then we used to come up on a Saturday, my dad would bring me up, and, uh, but 63-64 season, I got, got caught up in the uh, promotion season, mm. and uh, that's when uh, suddenly the interest arrived and uh, got caught up in it all. And um, two vivid memories, I can remember uh, winning 6-1 against Chesterfield right at the end of the season on a Wednesday night, Alan Banks with a hat-trick, and um, I can remember the euphoria of that night. And then the, uh, the last Saturday home game of the season, they lost 3-2 to Bradford. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being uh, really upset. So I think I had the, so I had the emotions, the, the high emotions of the euphoria and the disappointment. And I think that sort of really prepared me for the, the next 50 odd yeah, years of, of following the city. So yeah, yeah. And your dad was quite a talented footballer as well. Um, I believe he got some artifacts of some travel. Yes, yeah, he, um, he was... Uh, he went up to uh, Manchester United and Liverpool uh, in 1951, had trials up there, um, was offered the chance to go back to, for more trials, but I think then being sort of from North Devon, um, he didn't really fancy the idea of going up to the, the big city and there was no money in the game as, as well. So um, he declined that and he ended up his, his um, letters of invitation for trials at Exeter City and he came up here in 53 and he played um, for the Colts for a, a couple of seasons and um, yeah so it was it was it was in it, I think it was meant to be uh, that I was always going to come up here yeah definitely. Um, you recall some of your, your your first memories of the games the six wonder uh, hmm. victory over Chesterfield and then that defeat to, to Bradford can you just run us by what it was like as an, an atmosphere, a ground here during those times? Um, difficult to remember because being seven then, um, it is difficult to remember it, but it's just the fact that I just got caught up in it all. Mm. So there must have been, there, there, there obviously was a, an element of euphoria about the place that um, I just got caught up in. Started my scrapbook and first photographs there from uh, Easter Monday. Mm. Um, Easter Monday 64 when they drew 0-0 with Torquay and it was 16,000 in here yeah. Um, so yeah I think from then in, and we, we then got a, a season ticket because at that stage you could pay to come in to the ground over in the corner the Well Street corner there those steep steps you'd come up and then we had a season ticket which gave you a pass into the enclosure at the front of the the old grandstand okay. and that's where we used to we used to sit there so um, and yeah, just just got caught up in it all and going to school locally as schoolmates. So we ended up all coming up together as, as schoolmates and it's just, just carried on from there really, yeah. Um, who was your favorite Exeter City player um, of all time and, and why would you choose that player? Oh my God, I have so many, so I, I, I very difficult to pinpoint. I mean, obviously because I can remember Alan Banks um, and the fact that he's still here now, you can sort of see him up here on a Saturday. I mean, an absolute legend for the club. Um, I always like flair players, so people like, I mean, Lammy Robertson, I just like the flair he had about him. Stevie Neville as well. Um, you, obviously, the, you know, the, 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 the ones you always think about, obviously Stano, um, Tony Kello, Fred Binney. But I can go back to thinking about people like um, Arnold Mitchell and Keith Harvey, I can remember them. And they were just absolute stalwarts at the back, of, in a plane at the back there. and. And also people like Danny Bailey, just wholeheartedly committed to, to, the, to the cause. Never going to be the best, skill, most skillful player, but what he lacked for in ability, he certainly made up for an effort. And that's what you've, what you've always wanted to see here is it's just solid effort, really. So, yeah, yeah. What do you love most about Exeter City? Um, I, I think it's been very difficult to pinpoint, but I think the turning point was... 2003 
Mm. And I would say now in hindsight, um, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to the club. Mm. I mean, I can remember it at the time. And being on the pitch here, the last game of the, the season, when we got relegated, and seeing grown men cry, and it suddenly brought it home to you what this what this club meant to people and what it meant to me and my mates and I suppose the thought of not having a football club here after all that time and we'd suffered you know we'd had some highs we'd had some lows we had an awful lot of mediocrity <laughs> over over all those years but suddenly the the, the thought of not having a football club here um, was was the main mainstay of that suddenly what it meant to me and the place is unrecognizable now and I, I think that the three major factors then was firstly obviously becoming fan owned. I mean that you know, becoming trust owned was just such a major boost for the club. Um, the decision by Eamon Dolan and, and everyone else concerned to to keep the academy and fund the academy because they realised that potentially that was the only way we could keep the club going by developing players. In hindsight again what a fantastic decision. And then um, Dino's go against Doncaster, happy as Larry, yeah. and the Man United Cup matches. So, you know, I, to think that from where we were in 2003 to think what, six years later, there's 3,000 of us going to Ellen Road for the first Saturday of the season is just, just incredible. And um, I mean, now the club is unrecognised, as I said, the ground, the, the atmosphere, 200 odd volunteers coming in on a regular basis to help the club and it's you know I'm getting close to retirement now and it's certainly something that I'd like to like to sort of consider doing in some way uh, when that time comes but it's just it's everything I enjoyed the conference years actually um, I probably went to a more more away games during then than I did any other time and going to places like <laughs> Lee RMI Stafford Rangers um, it was it was just very very different and and of course the club we were winning more than we were losing so you know, you'll always enjoy it more when you when you're watching a, a winning side. So um, I enjoyed it, but yeah, getting back into the football league and and where we are now, and I think the whole the the, the business platform we've got here is 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 fantastic. Um, I'm resigned to us losing good players, yeah. and I was delighted when I, Ollie Ollie Watkins won his um, Sky Sports EFL. Uh, young player award I uh, was actually selected to come out and present the the trophy to him so I did that out on the pitch and that was a, that was a great honor um, but obviously losing the likes of Ollie Watkins we have to accept it and now we've got Archie Collins uh, Jack Sparks Ben Seymour I mean in a way I hope that we lose them because it means that they've developed they've done well it's money for the club and then we've got Alex Hartridge you've got Joel Randall um, Noah Smurd and all these young guys coming through and they all look exciting prospects. What I also like about this club now is that you've got people that will come here believing that they can improve their own careers. Um, I think back to some of the players we've had here over the years, people like um, Peter Taylor and Jerry Francis, yeah. um, you know, why were they here? Yeah. Now you look, think about, you know, why did Jaden Stockley come here? You know, he did so well for us, he did well for himself and the club benefited. Now I think someone like Randall Williams, potentially, to see someone with so much talent, and I know the club are bringing him on and developing more as a, a wing back than an exciting winger. And if we lose Randall in a year or two, so be it. But I, I'm convinced it's the right, the right business plan, the right business structure. And we've got to continue with it and stay trust owned. And um, yeah, I, I think, as I say, it goes back to this business model and, and these, you know, these youngsters that come up here and they develop them well, but we give them a chance. And OK, we have to give them a chance because we don't have the money to bring in, you know, suppose, supposedly star players. But these lads develop um, the, the way the club, the background of the club, the way they develop them, they bring them, they coach them on. And and um, sometimes you look at a player, I mean, you think about Jack Sparks and, you know, we saw him at 16 and we suddenly think, why, you know, why aren't they giving him a chance in the first team now after one or two games? He goes away and he plays at places like Salisbury mm. and he comes back a far better player. And you look at, again, Ollie Watkins, you know, he was such a, such a better player when he'd been out on loan. And I think it's getting these lads prepared in men's football and going out in, in sort of conference, conference south and so forth. I think the whole, the whole plan is um, all to the benefit of the club. And yeah, immense pride, immense pride.
Yeah. Um, I just want to touch on the supporter trust ownership model. You say that turning point. Um, is that one of the best things about being a Grecian that you've got that ownership model? You've got volunteers that that come in and help the club, and you've got it's basically owned by the fans, and they're and they're pushing the club forward. Is that one of the th best things you you think about being a Grecian? It is because, in my mind, we will never go back to those dark days of 2003. Um, yeah, I can remember all the, the, the hassles, and uh, you hear about these stories in the boardroom before, you know, the Freddie Starr episode here and all the rest of it, and you think, what on earth is going on? Um, and as I say, I, the business model means that we have a, a potential limit to where we can get. Um, certainly, you know, League One, it would be nice to see us challenging for the championship, but I'm quite happy to, to come up here, enjoy good football, enjoy a relatively uh, consistent winning side and um, just having a football club to support. Just would never want to go back to 2003. Um, when you think about your time supporting Exeter City and you recall a worst memory of following the club, is that 2003, that moment? Yeah, yeah, without doubt, yeah. The, the prospect of losing it, yeah, brought it home as to what it means to what it means to all of us, really. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If you could re-sign re one former City player, who would it be? Um, I suppose you'd have to go f with a striker, um, because you know we're we're playing great football. Putting the ball in the net is proving s slightly difficult at the moment, but yeah, if you go back to someone like Fred Binney. Tony Keller or even Alan Banks, someone that's a natural goal scorer. But I realise they're they're very very difficult now to uh, to achieve. And um, yeah, I I think possibly a, a goal scorer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and hopes for this season. How do you see it going? Um, I think we've got a, a got a good chance of of getting promotion. Um, the the playoffs. We've been through the playoff saga. In actual fact, the first game against uh, first playoff against Morecambe, I was actually on holiday in Tenerife um, after the semi-final against Oxford. Uh, went off to work the next day, and I was absolutely gutted about the fact I couldn't get to the final. But by lunchtime, my wife, bless her, had rung me and said, "It's all sorted. I've got you flights from Tenerife to Madrid to Heathrow uh, on the Saturday night, Sunday morning, and then uh, you're flying back first thing Monday morning back to join the holiday." And um, as it was, I actually teamed up with Alistair Yates, who was coming back from uh, uh, Halkadiki via Athens, and we shared a, a private hire cab from Heathrow to get us over to Wembley. So um, uh, the playoffs are great if you win it. It's, it's, uh, it's a long journey home if you lose. So um, automatic promotion would be the, would be the one. And um, this, is, um, this is a photograph that was taken uh, last season. Yeah. This is myself and my younger son and my grandson, uh, Travis, who was four at the time. He's now five. Uh, he's got a season ticket over in the, over in the, the stagecoach stand. And um, remembering how I really sort of got uh, impacted on this club uh, in the promotion season 63-64. And then if, uh, if Travis and my son, and obviously Travis could, could enjoy that now, I know that, uh, you know, they'll my... Be well. They'll be hooked as well, most definitely, yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, I just wondered if we could have a look at your scrapbook yeah. and you could just talk yeah. about it. Because yeah. it, you've got some very interesting uh, memorabilia in there. Yeah, yeah this was um, the scrapbook I started, photographs from the Express and Echo, 63-64. Uh, yeah. And the first photos here, um, this is the crowd on the Big Bank, 16,000 uh, against Torquay, uh, Easter Monday, uh, 64. And it, uh, ironically enough, there's another photo here of some young fans uh, at the front of the, the, the Big Bank on that day. Um, ironically, when I moved to Exmouth in 1967, and then I went on to um, play local football Sundays, and I actually met these guys, realised who these guys were, and one of them is a, is a season ticket holder, and we still travel up to the games now together, yeah. so it was quite ironic. And there's, um, there's also, there's a, a fabulous, there's a picture, this is Alan Banks, um, this was the night of the 6-1 victory over Chesterfield, and the fans um, celebrating with him on, on the pitch at the end of the game when he scored a hat-trick, um, but something that always sticks in my mind, this panoramic picture of um, St. James's Park. 
This was taken on the last Saturday, last home game of the season when they lost to Bradford. And um, I think the last sentence says, uh, a souvenir worthy of a memorable city season on which the curtain, generally speaking, went down today. And that, that I can remember that emotion of that day. And with, with, with that uh, <coughs> Bradford game, when, when they lost hmm. to Bradford at home, would, that didn't deny them promotion? Did it? No, because they went to Workington the following Saturday. It was, uh, it was probably the longest journey you could have. My dad went, uh, they drew nil-nil, and they... Um, they came back and there was big celebrations at St David's Station, but they, they got in, they squeezed in fourth place. Oh. So they did get, they did get promotion, but... Uh, but not at St James's Park. Not at okay. St James's Park, no. Yeah. No, it was, it, was, it was decided on the final day at Workington. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in and showing us all, all those uh, memorabilia. It's been fascinating, fascinating chat. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome.